so welcome to everyone to this uh, Green New Deal um, seminar where we will discuss green policies in, in Europe and, and beyond. Um, and my name is Emma Hakala. I'm a visiting uh, senior fellow here at uh, FIA. And I will be chairing this seminar. And in that role, I would ask everyone in the audience to uh, please keep your mics muted and your, your cameras off, just in order to make sure that we have a smooth connection throughout the seminar and, and no sort of uh, disruptions. Um, and also as an organizatory note, um, towards the end of the seminar or webinar, uh, we will have some space for questions. So please write them in the, in the chat function. And then uh, I guess I will be the one who gets to choose the, the questions, but I will place them to the, to the speakers so that we don't have any also um, complications with the, with the connections. Uh, but let's get started because we don't have that much time and we have a very interesting topic. Uh, so we, and also very, very good speakers today. So we will be talking about the Green Deal in Europe. Um, and in connection to this, our own uh, Marco Siddi, who will be one of the speakers today, uh, has actually published a really good working paper uh, just today at FIA on the topic. And I would recommend that every one of you <laughs> goes and, and reads it because it's a very good introduction to the, to the topic and to the uh, different opportunities and challenges that the EU is facing in this regard. Uh, but also we will have what I expect to be a really interesting discussion about this, this topic today and as I said very very good uh, speakers um, so in fact let's just maybe uh, get on with it uh, just maybe as a kind of an introduction to the to the topic uh, as you might know the the European Commission published this um, uh, green deal uh, program at the end of last year which is a rather uh, ambitious um, uh, climate uh, and environmental uh, policy, um, which will now be then implemented. But of course, now with the COVID-19 situation, we have a very um, kind of unexpected uh, challenge and a really new situation in, in which the, the Green Deal program should be implemented. So we shall see how it goes and, and the, the discussion kind of keeps moving forward all the time. So. So there will be a lot to discuss, and I'm sure that the audience will also have really interesting questions. Uh, but now I will present our excellent speakers. I will maybe present both of you right at the beginning, so then we can just move along. So first we have Johannes Urpelainen, who is the director, and Prince Sultan bin Abdulaziz, professor of energy, resources, and environment at the um, School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins, and he's also the director um, of the uh, Initiative for Sustainable, Sustainable Energy Policy. And he's a very prolific writer, and uh, some of you might also know him from, from Twitter. <laughs> and then we have Marco Siddi, who is a senior research fellow here at FIA. Uh, he is in the European program and focuses on European politics, EU-Russia relations and energy politics. And he has studied at Oxford and the Diplomatic Ac Academy of Vienna and the University of Ed Edinburgh. And he has published very widely in, in very uh, esteemed journals. So he will then uh, present his today's paper and give his remarks um, after Johannes but uh, let's now first give the floor to, to Johannes. So please go ahead. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Johannes Urpelainen from uh, Johns Hopkins. And uh, I'm just going to give a very brief overview of, first of all, why the, the Green New Deal and this green stimulus is an, is an essential uh, issue for the future of uh, climate and clean energy. And then second, I want to say a few words about what's happening here in the United States. That will be very short because we haven't had much green stimulus here. 
So the reason why I think this topic is going to be essential is that to me, it seems quite clear that public finance is really going to dominate uh, the economic recovery from the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. We've already seen, for example, in the energy sector that uh, the International Energy Agency expects a $400 billion decrease in energy investments um, this year. We also expect and we see that the oil and gas industry is struggling uh, with uh, decreased demand, decreased profitability. Uh, coal um, industries is also struggling, though curiously enough, some East Asian and South Asian countries are currently planning new coal-fired power plants. Aviation is obviously in serious trouble. The traveling industry is, is reeling. So if we look at all this, it seems to me that the importance of public finance in energy investment is really going to grow. And when we combine this with historically low interest rates, here in the United States, we are now basically at zero interest rate, um, not yet at negative interest rates, but still uh, at a historically low level. It, it really seems that public finance is going to be critically important for the direction uh, of the world economy when we recover, hopefully recover from this uh, pandemic uh, recession. The Situation here in the United States um, is, is unfortunately not not very very promising. We we know that uh, the United States government has taken a very decisive action to deal with the economic impacts of the coronavirus crisis. Our um, handling of the public health crisis has been quite poor and disorganized, whereas on the economic front, the measures have been much more aggressive. So we have seen a very um, kind of large spending by the Congress. So we have the $2 trillion CARES Act, and they are currently discussing uh, the, the follow-up to that. We have also seen from the uh, Federal Reserve, we have seen uh, very active uh, stimulus measures. So overall, the public spending has been uh, really quite unprecedented uh, here, and that has uh, resulted in uh, interesting phenomena like for example the u.s stock market is actually doing quite well even though the economy uh, and kind of real people are are struggling but unfortunately this spending has not been targeted to the kind of uh, industries of the future there are no specific measures basically at all uh, for things like renewable energy electric vehicles um, technology to allow telecommuting all these things have been ignored. And that's maybe not surprising if we look at what President Trump thinks in general about all this kind of new industry as opposed to the old industry. I think what's going to be really decisive here is what's going to happen in the presidential election. Uh, do many people surprise uh, candidate Biden uh, of the Democratic Party has actually come out with some really progressive Green Deal, uh, Green New Deal policies. He was initially kind of thought of as a kind of centrist uh, candidate with very cautious approach to this, but if you look at some of his recent plans, they really look more like what you would expect from Elizabeth Warren. So lots of public spending, uh, lots of measures to kind of rebuild the economy with public finance, and of course a lot of uh, interest and investment in climate policy as well. So I think we are going to have to wait until November to see how all this is going to play out, but um, to summarize, we haven't seen a whole lot yet, but we might see uh, much more uh, active measures if President, uh, we will have President Biden in 2021. 20, uh, and at that point, the United States would kind of join some of these other major economies like South Korea and uh, it seems also the European Union in uh, this green stimulus wave. So that's uh, my preliminary remarks, and I'd be very happy to uh, pass the baton to, to Marco now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Johannes, for the very um, concise <laughs> first comments. And now let's uh, move on to Marco. So the, the floor is yours. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Emma, and thank you, Johannes. So back to Europe. Uh, I will try to briefly uh, outline what the European Green Deal is about. First of all, when we talk about the European Green Deal, we refer to the communication of the European Commission of the 11th of uh, December 2019. And um, if you had the chance to look at this document, it is uh, mostly a roadmap of key policies for the EU's climate agenda, based on which the Commission has developed and will develop legislative proposals and strategies. 
So how did we get uh, this to uh, December 2019 and to the current developments? Well, when uh, um, the communication was presented, uh, the European Union was already implementing its uh, three headline targets for 2020, uh, and uh, it had already agreed upon new targets for 2030. What are these targets? Uh, very briefly, uh, the, with only a reference to the three headline targets. By 2030, uh, the EU has agreed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by at least 40 percent compared to 1990 levels. Um, also by 2030, 32 percent of um, uh, the energy consumed in the EU should come from renewable energy sources. And there should also be a 32.5 percent improvement in energy efficiency. So this was already in place before uh, the Green Deal uh, came about. Uh, there were several political developments that, in my view, uh, played an important role in the run-up to, uh, to the Green Deal. First of all, the growing evidence of the climate crisis, which in 2018 and 2019 was highlighted by uh, the continued uh, melting of uh, glaciers, uh, of polar ice, um, forest fires in Sweden, uh, in Siberia, and also the bushfires in Australia uh, last year. Uh, there, there was also uh, um, a rise in civil society movements, most prominently the Fridays for Future um, youth uh, movement. Um, and also, in the European context, uh, the uh, good performance of uh, green parties, especially in, uh, in larger member states in the European parliamentary elections of 2019, may have played a role uh, in the decision of uh, the new Commission President Ursula von der Leyen to uh, uh, focus uh, her mandate as Commission President on the Green Deal. Finally, uh, we could say that there was also uh, um, a negative incentive. Uh, the rise to power of climate change deniers in important uh, states and partners, such as the United States uh, and Brazil, um, against the background of the climate crisis, increased the urgency of, uh, of climate policy. So what are the main aspects of the uh, European Green Deal? The most popularized goal is achieving zero net emissions of greenhouse gases by 2050. Uh, this is uh, um, stated in the uh, Commission communication, and it is also enshrined in the um, climate law. For now, we have a draft in Article 2.1 of the climate law that the European Commission presented in early March 2020. Uh, some key aspects of the Green Deal um, are also a just transition mechanism, um, which includes a just transition fund uh, for regions that are more heavily re reliant on coal and the coal industry. So to help this region transition towards uh, a green economy. There are then uh, several important plans, uh, such as the introduction of a carbon border adjustment mechanism, a sustainable Europe investment plan, um, and then several strategies, among which uh, um, the farm to fork uh, sustainable agricultural strategy uh, and the new EU biodiversity strategy for 2030. So you see that it's uh, quite a comprehensive plan and uh, it will have to be articulated in detail over the next months and, and years, uh, in fact. Um, but let's take a bit of a closer look uh, at the draft climate law. Uh, this law, so it was presented in early March uh, 2020, so just before uh, the lockdown was uh, announced in many European countries. Um, so besides specifying the net zero target, um, it also has some interesting um, aspects concerning uh, legal powers. For example, Article 3 of the uh, draft climate law is very important because it empowers uh, the European, or it would empower, if this becomes uh, law, uh, it would empower the European Commission to review the trajectory towards climate neutrality every five years, starting from 2023. 
Why is this important? Because the Commission would be uh, able to review the targets by delegated acts, uh, which means without having to go through full negotiations with the European Parliament and the Member States. So this is expected to be uh, somewhat controversial, especially with uh, the Council and the Member States. At the same time, it's also true that the draft climate law and Article 9 specifically puts uh, strict limits on uh, what the Commission can do. The Parliament and the Council could revoke the delegated acts, um, the delegated powers anytime, and also the Commission has to uh, consult experts from the Member States, so it doesn't have uh, that much free room. But at the same time, using uh, delegated uh, acts would also allow the Commission to, uh, uh, to be more energetic and more direct, faster while acting in the international arena, while negotiating with other major powers. Also very important for the um, medium run is that Article 2.3 of, of the draft climate law uh, states that the Commission will explore options to uh, revise the 2030 uh, climate targets and especially increase uh, the greenhouse gas reduction target to 50-55% uh, less than uh, 1990. So it's preparing for more ambition. And the second part of my presentation, I will focus on the key priorities um, and the challenges also as, as I see them uh, today. So the um, main challenge is, or the first challenge is political, it's maintaining policy priority. Uh, and there are um, several issues that uh, could work against this. Uh, um, one is um, the possibility of increased geopolitical competition, which could distract shift the focus away from, from the Green Deal. Um, usually geopolitical uh, competition, as we saw with the Ukraine crisis in 2014, leads to a more narrow understanding of the security of supply. And in the past, uh, Europe has uh, switched to focusing more on uh, domestic uh, fossil fuels that are seen as more secure. There are several debates about uh, accessing, um, um, uh, for example, um, well, primary um, uh, raw materials that are necessary to implement um, uh, the green transition and specifically uh, for renewable energy. And uh, the fact that a lot of these are found in China and potential geopolitical competitors. So there is a potential for this, but uh, as you can imagine, um, my point is that the main challenge is maintaining uh, priority in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic and the ensuing economic slowdown. Um, well, the main risk is that the Green Deal could be deprioritized. Um, some uh, delays in its implementation have already been announced. They are not very significant for now. So the key uh, goal is keeping priority in the European recovery program. Um, and if you had the chance to look at uh, yesterday's uh, uh, communication of the European Commission called Europe's Moment, so this is the recovery program, well, actually this is quite good news because uh, we saw that the 750 billion euros of the next generation EU fund uh, um, should be spent uh, keeping in mind that the green and the digital transition are the top priorities. And the spending should be in line with the national energy and climate plans that each member state has prepared and has developed, uh, um, and also the just transition plans that are being prepared also at uh, member state level. Uh, in the same document, so the documents that the Commission published uh, yesterday, the climate law is also mentioned, so this is uh, important. Um, uh, the uh, revision, so the uh, increased ambition for the 2030 targets is also mentioned. And there, are also, there is also stress on some aspects, uh, for example, concerning energy efficiency, uh, the doubling, uh, the renovation rate of buildings uh, in the next years, the creation of one million uh, new green jobs, 
and the strengthening of the just transition mechanism. However, um, we have to see if these, um, if these promises are translated into practice. And if we look at the financial endowment, this would be the second challenge. On the one hand, uh, we see that the Commission's own estimates uh, predict a need for an additional 260 billion euros per year, so 2.6 trillion until 2030. However, the Commission itself uh, has pledged to mobilize 1 trillion euros. So already here the numbers do not really add up. And also if we take a closer look at uh, uh, the funding, uh, where it's coming from, if it's really new, some researchers at uh, Bruegel have done this in um, very good detail. Um, and we could perhaps go more into this in the discussion, but uh, to keep it short, uh, there, is, there seems to be quite a lot of reshuffling of existing funds. So a lot of the funds is not uh, new. The second issue is that uh, the total 1 trillion euros is based on large multipliers of expected investment. So this is money that is not um, coming from the EU budget, but it's private uh, and also state level investments that should be activated by EU uh, policies. And also an additional uh, challenge is um, the reliance on private financing. Uh, we think that a lot of private companies also have stakes in the fossil fuel industry. We have to see how fast they will be at investing and switching their focus on, on the green um, uh, economy. Uh, I have already introduced this, but the third key challenge is the legal competence of EU institutions. Um, to implement uh, the Green Deal, uh, EU institutions will need legal competence. Um, here, the first obstacle is that uh, according to the uh, EU treaties and specifically the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, uh, energy is shared competence between uh, the EU institutions and member states, Article 4 and Article 194 of the treaty specifically. Uh, so some key questions are, Will the European Parliament and especially the Council agree to the use of uh, delegated powers by the Commission? Uh, will all member states accept stricter targets for 2030 uh, to begin with? Then uh, my last uh, point and challenge uh, concerns international cooperation. Uh, the um, Commission communication on the European Green Deal uh, has some very important points. For example, the pledge to gear trade policy to support the Paris Agreement and to introduce sustainability criteria in new trade deals of the EU. Um, so we have to see if this is implemented. Um, and also cooperation with major powers, uh, with major polluters will be necessary. Um, so as according to the Paris Agreement, uh, um, or based on the Paris Agreement, uh, the different states uh, have a different timetable uh, to, um, well, to contribute to climate policy and different levels of ambition. And the EU is one of the most ambitious uh, um, actors uh, globally. Uh, the EU will have to most likely introduce a border carbon adjustment uh, mechanism, so a tax to prevent carbon leakage. Uh, to prevent uh, um, uh, so uh, greenhouse gas intensive production from moving abroad. And this can prove challenging for a number of reasons. Uh, there is a risk that uh, um, this could disadvantage uh, imports from, uh, from the global south, so affect negatively uh, poorer economies. Um, the EU has to make sure that uh, such a mechanism is compatible with WTO law, so that it, it's not seen as green protectionism. And uh, such a mechanism should also be balanced to act as a stimulus uh, for other major polluters to act accordingly. So to uh, incentivize other major emitters to, uh, uh, um, to adopt similar policies and not engage in tariff wars. Uh, also in this respect, and this is my uh, very last uh, point, 
the uh, Commission communication, uh, Europe's moment, published yesterday, has some uh, reassuring uh, um, uh, parts. Uh, actually, the communication states that a border carbon adjustment mechanism will be presented in 2021 if uh, levels of ambition globally uh, remain different. So we can be uh, quite sure that this is going to be the case. So by 2021, the Commission will present um, border carbon adjustment mechanism based on uh, uh, what was stated yesterday at least. And it was also stated that uh, um, the income from this mechanism will help repay uh, the funds raised for the recovery program, so for uh, the next generation EU program. Okay, I stop here and I look forward to your questions. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Marco. Uh, and now we can start with the questions. Um, I see that there already is, is one question or comment, um, but please, if you have any any comments, uh, please write them in the in the chat, and then I will I will place your questions to the uh, speakers. Uh, I would maybe start with uh, just Johannes maybe commenting on how the the European Green Deal looks from the from the US and, and is there any chance that it might maybe somehow influence the discussion there? So I I, I think it's first of all it, it does look very ambitious from from our perspective. I, I was kind of glad to see that there is uh, at least an, an effort to do this and especially at the European level because as, as we've known. Uh, one of the challenges that the European Union has faced in the past that it hasn't been able to act as sort of um, in a kind of coherent unit the same way that the US federal government as a kind of, uh, government of a national uh, sovereign country is able to do. So that's, uh, I think, is, uh, is exciting. Uh, as for influence, if we will have a Trump administration moving forward, I don't think it would have much impact. I think... Uh, uh, it might even encourage some kind of a backlash or sort of negative response. Um, if we have a Biden administration, then I think it will look very different. I think there could be an opportunity there to build some collaboration. So, for example, here in the U.S., there is right now a proposal to kind of redesign the National uh, Science Foundation, as a National Science and Technology Foundation, with a $100 billion funding opportunity. And energy innovation would be one of the key themes in that area. So that would certainly create an opportunity for transatlantic uh, collaboration. But again, it will require a different presidential uh, kind of, uh, administration to, to make that happen. Okay, really interesting. Thank you for, for that. Uh, then we have some uh, questions from Ola Stynkkynen, who first of all notes that um, that the European Parliament might not be very supportive of delegating powers to the European Commission on this climate issue. So how, how should we deal with that? Uh, and then he also asks, uh, what tools, if any, does the Commission have, either the Jure or de facto, to direct the national recovery packages of the member states to a sust sustainable direction? So I guess uh, Marco can go at least first with, with these. Right, yes, it's uh, I mean, two very important points. Um, yes, the European Parliament uh, could oppose the delegation of, of powers. And actually, uh, I discussed this also in, uh, in the paper. Uh, there was already one instance where the legal service of the Parliament said that such delegation might not be uh, or is not in, uh, um, in line with Article 290 of the uh, Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. Um, so the Commission might potentially face a coalition opposing uh, this use of delegated powers, coalition made up by sceptical uh, member states, let's think of Poland, the Czech Republic, and, uh, their representatives in EU institutions. Um, um, so it, it might not be uh, um, easy. At the same time, uh, the European Parliament, I mean, there is a, um, a proposal the European Parliament uh, that was discussed uh, in, in, uh, in early May uh, concerning the goals for 2030. And this proposal, which is supported by the Social Democratic Group, uh, the Left Group, and I guess also the Green Group, 
um, uh, proposes even greater uh, ambition, so a 65% greenhouse gas emission target by 2030. We have to see whether uh, everyone agrees, um, because the support of other party groups is also necessary. Um, and it seems that at least there will be uh, support for a 50 to 55 uh, percent target um, um, with all or with most of the of the groups. Uh, regarding the commission tools, uh, this is another uh, um, very uh, present uh, and difficult point um, because the commission is um, trying to uh, um, uh, impose um, so a focus on, uh, on green and digital goals in the funding that comes from the EU budget, so the, let's say, EU level stimulus. And then again, already for this one, we have to see how this is done, uh, because usually the monitoring mechanisms of the European Commission are now based on, uh, uh, so monitoring recommendations. Um, it's a bit more difficult when it comes to imposing decisions, even though potentially, uh, I guess, um, it's possible. A lawyer would be more specific on this. Um, but the key question is about uh, uh, state level um, support mechanisms. Uh, the Commission has so far uh, declined to attach um, uh, conditions to, to state level uh, support. Uh, so this is also the main criticism that is coming now from uh, environmental organizations and uh, will the state level funding end up supporting the fossil fuel industry or polluting um, uh, enterprises. Okay, uh, does Johannes maybe want to comment anything on that or? No, uh, that, that I don't have anything to add to this one. Okay, uh, then kind of connected to the, the previous question, uh, Kathleen Kirna asks if there is any threat that the climate skeptic forces will gain significant power in, in Europe or at least in the important member states. Uh, and maybe Marco can start again with, with that. Well, we could say that in some member states uh, they are already in power and uh, this is why we are expecting uh, uh, opposition from, uh, well, opposition is already there. For example, uh, Poland uh, a few months ago uh, declined to commit to the uh, neutrality, uh, carbon neutrality goal by 2050. And uh, there were also some politicians uh, like uh, in the Czech Republic, uh, Babish, that were, was uh, arguing that we should drop uh, the European Green Deal. Um, so there will be opposition, but at the same time, there is also uh, considerable support, uh, support coming from uh, the larger um, member states, um, from the European Commission, from several uh, party groups in the European Parliament. So we can expect a uh, backlash, uh, but at the same time, um, this is not, I, I think it's not a good enough reason to uh, um, to lower ambition. Yes, okay. Um, Johannes, did you want to add something? Yeah, just one point on this. I think in, in general, this is a very interesting time to uh, look into the, the issue of climate skepticism because it's so directly linked to this idea that you cannot trust scientists and you cannot trust government. So I think a lot of this really depends on how well the sort of more progressive uh, climate friendly governments handle this uh, coronavirus crisis, handle the economic recession. Do people have a general sense that, well, it, it looks like we can actually trust the authorities to do the right thing. And um, it's, it's hard to say, for example, in Germany right now, on the one hand, you know, the, the German government has done a good job managing this, this whole thing. But at the same time, there is a growing backlash against uh, all these restrictions and everything. And there's now some concern that maybe Merkel's kind of organized, structured uh, opening might not work out uh, because of this backlash. So I think it's, it's really linked to these broader debates about government, science, authority, and all that. If I can add something, by the way, I forgot to mention, uh, the just transition mechanism of the Commission uh, aimed exactly at 
uh, uh, convincing uh, the countries that uh, would lose more because of their reliance on coal. So, for example, uh, Poland. And another important point is to ensure that the cost of the transition does not fall on the poorest social strata. I think this was a bit also the lesson of the Gilets Jaunes uh, movement in, in, in France. So the risk that certain uh, groups uh, um, pay more because this could lead to the thinking that it's uh, uh, the trendy hipsters and the richer people that want the Green Deal and the transition. <laughs> Yeah, really good points. That's very interesting. Um, let's see, we have some more questions here. <laughs> um, oh, sorry, I keep losing the questions somehow. Um, but somebody asked, uh, yes, Timo Partanen asked um, about the environmental threshold conditions in the financeability of the Commission proposal of yesterday, uh, whether they are in line with the Green Deal, and do you think they will remain in place uh, through the negotiation uh, of the of the proposal? Uh, do you have any thoughts on that, Marco? Well, if I understand the question correctly, uh, it seems that uh, the Commission is really committed to, to the Green Deal because uh, the communication uh, from yesterday uh, reiterates several key points of the Green Deal. So not just the 2050 goal, which is far away, but also the uh, revision of uh, 2030 targets, which is much more relevant in the short run and uh, much more immediate in terms of political commitment. Um, what the negotiations will lead to, uh, we have to see. Um, but um, I think that um, having conditions on um, so the green spending, so on spending the funds on uh, uh, green objectives, could also come some way towards meeting the conditions that are uh, asked by the so-called frugal four. <laughs> um, uh, so um, I think there is a political momentum. Uh, then we have to see also how things develop in the next months, how big the uh, recession is, uh, if there is a second wave. Um, for now, it seems, I mean, the document uh, from yesterday, which I uh, read relatively fast, but it looks encouraging. Yes, um, and then we have a question from Kai Granholm. Uh, which maybe you could both comment on, uh, kind of from your own perspectives. Uh, he asks what the EU, or maybe in this case, what in general could be done uh, to steer more of the global private investment to this this region, I guess he means uh, Europe, uh, for sustainable solutions and, and green sectors. Maybe Johannes can go first. I can, I can go first. Um, I think this, it's, a, it's a great question. And uh, I would imagine that there's sort of, let's say, three pillars to getting something like this right. One is certainly the public finance. So you can think of this stimulus bill as a kind of catalyst. It's probably not itself going to be enough to really transform everything. But you know how when people design these public finance packages, they're trying to figure out like every euro spent how many uh, euros will the private sector then spend as a, as a result of that? So if you take that approach, then uh, that's sort of number one. Um, the second one, of course, then is you do need to have these realistic growth prospects, right? So the private well, sector is, is really well, most uh, interested in uh, making profits. So there needs to be some kind of realistic prospect uh, the business environment needs to be right, which is something that I think the European Union has struggled a little bit uh, after the 2008 financial crisis with sort of problems at the macroeconomic level. And I would imagine that the third one is then is just a kind of a general uh, sort of political stability and uh, kind of good environment, uh, again, for investment, which is less of a problem, but with Brexit, with Hungary, these are kind of things that do come to uh, people's mind when they think of these things. But I think it's a combination of sort of public finance and at the same time uh, kind of creating the right conditions for private sector investment in this area. Okay, and then Marco. Um, yeah, I mean, there is definitely a um, potential uh, role for private finance, or this is very much what the European Commission uh, expects. 
So if we break down the 1 trillion euros, um, 500 billions should come from the EU budget, uh, even though only a fraction of this is additional compared to previous efforts. Uh, but both for the just transition mechanism uh, uh, and for the uh, invest EU fund, well, big part of this money should come from uh, both uh, state finance and private funds. So, for example, the invest EU fund uh, should trigger 279 uh, billion euros, and a uh, big part of this is expected to come from, for, uh, from private funds. Okay. Um, well, then there is a comment saying that uh, there was a lot of uh, just transition, uh, uh, or it was increased a lot in the in the uh, Commission's proposal yesterday, uh, and that Poland seems to be happy about it, um, and of course many trade unions and and so on. So in in that sense, maybe this is a sign that um, that this kind of funding and this mechanism seems to be working or could work. Uh, so it has a lot of potential. Um, you can still ask more questions, but while we're waiting for for more, uh, I would actually ask you something about the kind of global role of the EU as this global climate leader uh, and your thoughts on the on, on how this uh, Green Deal proposal or program uh, sort of emphasizes the EU's global role in, in this regard. Uh, maybe Johannes can start. Yes, absolutely. So I, I think to me it, it really depends on how successful this, uh, this effort is. If the European Union is able to demonstrate that this kind of green stimulus on the one hand uh, kind of accelerates progress toward uh, low carbon development and a kind of energy transition and a broader social uh, transition in uh, in the sustainability area, while at the same time also producing the kinds of outcomes that governments are always very worried, like growth, uh, tax revenue, uh, employment, then that could really uh, put the kind of European Union uh, front and center when it comes to uh, ideas and, and as other governments are looking for sort of what they should do. If on the other hand, the results are kind of underwhelming, something goes wrong in the implementation or the underlying theory that the public sector can play a key role in reinvigorating the European economy, if that turns out to be wrong, then in those cases, it's probably not going to uh, help the European Union's case. Because I, I really do think these governments are going to be extremely sensitive to economic outcomes, especially now that they have this accumulating public debt combined with aging populations and kind of a serious fiscal uh, challenges ahead. Yes, and then Marco. Yes, I, I agree with all of this. Um, so I'll just add to it. Um, in terms of um, global reach and cooperation, uh, of course, as already stated, a lot depends on the outcome of the US elections. Um, um, also, another open question was uh, how this will affect uh, relations with China. So we are talking about the two largest emitters. Um, um, there was supposed to be an EU-China summit in September. Uh, now, I'm not sure if this is uh, taking place, but uh, the EU was trying to, um, um, to clarify its ambition also in view of, of these important negotiations. Um, we also have to see how uh, the fora where the EU is hoping to promote uh, climate policy will work. Um, so the, G the G20, for example, um, already now the EU could uh, work with the fourth largest uh, emitters, which is Russia, uh, and prepare for the introduction of mechanisms such as uh, the, the border carbon adjustment. So to induce uh, uh, large Russian uh, companies that have substantial investments in Europe uh, to, to adapt, to switch to more sustainable uh, um, um, production and, and energy. Great, thank you. Um, we still have time for some more questions. I realized that I, I missed one, so I will ask that. But if you have anything more to ask, please, please do. You have a 
a great chance to ask these great speakers. Um, but the, the remaining question is uh, whether the, the Commission's uh, new monitoring role could be linked to the, to the European semester, or is there an attempt to harmonize the, the European semester's fiscal and macroeconomic targets with climate and biodiversity targets? And maybe Marco can start again. Yes, well, um, let me just quote from, uh, from the Commission communication uh, from yesterday. Uh, on page five, it states that uh, the recovery and resilience facility with a budget of 560 billion euros, so uh, a big part of, of the total, uh, should be spent in line, um, well, based on the investment and reform priorities identified as part of the European semester in line with the national climate and energy plans, just transition plans. So the European semester is there and it's one of the uh, key elements um, for the guidelines of, of this spending. Johannes, do you have any? From my side, this is a bit outside my usual wheelhouse. Yeah. Uh, we don't seem to have any more questions, surprisingly. Um, I guess we have been very, very clear. <laughs> um, but uh, maybe uh, we still have quite a lot of time. So maybe I would still um, ask uh, actually something again from from the from the US side um, um, because I know that there there has been a lot of like different kinds of sort of uh, green new deal uh, initiatives uh, coming from the US and also this idea of just just transition is very very influential there uh, so I'd be interested in hearing Johannes's comments uh, on that and whether those could somehow also inspire the, the European discussion. Yes, absolutely. So um, I, I, I do think that the just transition uh, angle is something where there's a lot of opportunity for transatlantic kind of exchange of experiences and lessons because um, even though the, the the federal government currently hasn't taken an interest in the in the green stimulus aspect, uh, the just transition is very important from a political perspective. Uh, we know that these kind of communities that depend on coal mining most importantly, but also increasingly facing difficulties with, for example, shale gas or shale oil, these tend to be in very important uh, states. So we have on the one hand, some of these very small states like Wyoming and Montana, where you have two senators, even though the population of these states is, is very, very small. In Wyoming, it's well below one million people. So these are extremely important areas um, from that perspective. The other one, and even more important, is the so-called battleground states where these presidential elections are really fought. And I'm in particular thinking of Pennsylvania, which is both coal mining and a very large shale gas industry. So if there are ways there to sort of create alternative opportunities and economic diversification for these communities that have benefited greatly from the fossil fuel industry, but are now kind of struggling because of these difficulties and, and the, the high cost and the low profitability, those could be really important from a political perspective. And I bet that Joe Biden, when he goes to Pennsylvania, he will be talking about these things. He's going to make a big deal of the fact that he's going to create some kind of a stimulus plan for the Appalachian and, and for the Marshalls uh, shale area, because those votes are going to be critical and uh, those communities are looking for this kind of solution. So. And that, to me, doesn't seem that different, for example, from Poland's perspective or some of this coal mining in eastern Germany. I think a lot of the challenge there is the same, that these are politically powerful uh, kind of communities and, and locations. And if the Just Transition Fund can help them accept that we need to get through this transition, that could be very powerful uh, at the European level. Just think of all the damage that Poland alone has done. Uh, in, in the European climate policy. It's really quite remarkable. And if Poland were to change its direction, that would be a huge thing for Europe. Exactly. Uh, Marco, do you have any comments on that? Uh, well, I agree um, on everything that was said. Uh, um, and the US side, I, I know much less. So I think I will, uh, I will leave it there. All right. Um, well, since we don't appear to have any more questions, uh, I would maybe ask you to give some kind of sort of final uh, remarks. 
And maybe I would be interested in hearing your thoughts also on um, on whether or how do you see the future of the of the Green Deal or or overall this sort of climate policy and and it's maybe uh, better integration into other policies like economic policy and industrial policy and so on um, because now it seems that it's it has become quite a sort of stable uh, aspect of of all kinds of policy making. Um, especially now, I think the COVID-19 crisis shows that even this kind of like uh, general crisis, global crisis, hasn't really that much shaken the, the different countries and, for example, EU's commitment to the to the goal. Uh, but do you think that there are any threats in the in the future of of this uh, uh, climate policy um, sort of direction and? and uh, what could be done to make sure that that it won't get sort of uh, sort of uh, out of the way or something so, so let me just say briefly i first i want to note i think we do have two new questions here uh from uh, pia Björkbaka and uh, marcus oyala uh, but just to answer your question emma um uh, Marco knows much more about the specific mechanisms, but I think the comments that we had from Oras Tynkunen earlier today are, are kind of key. So one challenge is making sure that the European Union itself works as a kind of coherent unit. So, for example, the European Parliament and the European Commission, are they going to be able to work together or will they have different ideas? And then the second one is how do you get the national governments to play along? So again, is there, what can the European Commission, the European Union do, uh, do, do to direct uh, national governments and can they find a way to work together? So those seem on a high level, the kind of issues that come to my mind, but again, Marco knows much more about the you know, specific details of the European context. Yeah, well, um, I'm, I have to say that for now, it seems that uh, the policy priority is being kept on the Green Deal at the same time, there are many potential challenges because, of course, one thing is the rhetoric, another is the implementation. So, for example, uh, now the EU is deciding on a taxonomy uh, of green projects, and this will be very important for the allocation of funding. Um, so, um, critics argue that there could be greenwashing involved, so that projects that are not really green uh, get the funding, especially as a result of private lobbying. So there will have to be um, constant scrutiny of how the money is spent to make sure that, that it actually goes into uh, initiatives that promote uh, the green transition. Exactly. Uh, and you are right, Johannes, I somehow missed that there were new questions. And since we still have time, uh, maybe I'll just, uh, I won't let you go yet, but I will uh, ask them both now. and. And you can see what you have to answer. So, uh, Pia Björkbakka asks um, that since the public funding seems to be more important now after the, the corona thing, um, is there a reason that the, the EU should consider its state aid policies? Uh, and then from Markus Oyala, uh, do you see that the primary weight of the EDG is on the Commission? Uh, or EU's new powers and mandates, uh, or in mobilizing new EU-wide investments. So, I don't know, maybe Marco can start first. Right. Um, so, let me start from, uh, uh, from the last question. Um, the way it is in the Commission is, uh, in terms of um, making proposals, um, so the Commission has definitely a very important role, but uh, it won't be enough. Uh, so cooperation with member states will be essential and even if uh, they play a secondary role now, uh, private funding will also uh, retain some importance. Um, yeah, regarding state aid, uh, this is not really my uh, field of, of expertise, but I believe that there is a reconsideration of uh, EU policies in this respect. And this, it's also quite telling that whenever uh, there is a serious crisis, uh, the state comes back. And uh, I can imagine that, um, or at least in my opinion, the state has to play uh, an essential role in the green transition. We cannot leave it uh, to the market because market mechanisms have, have often not worked in, in the past. And there has to be um, um, direction from, uh, from the state, from European institutions. 
So in my opinion, this will be one of the way of um, spending uh, state money uh, in the upcoming future and also in the longer run. Then Johannes. Yeah, so I'll just add very briefly um, on the on the issue of state aid. I think uh, Pekka Saloma's comment in the chat is is is, is right on here. Uh, yes, in the sense that there is a need for sort of more active and effective industrial policy, but at the same time, we know that governments tend to abuse state aid. And here in the United States, for example, we've seen a lot of the stimulus funding has gone to big companies that don't need it because they are very well connected politically. So the the state aid policies really need to be designed in a way that while they would allow more effective kind of uh, direction setting, there still needs to be some accountability so that they don't actually go to, for example, uh, creating zombie coal mines that keep going with, with state aid uh, because it's too easy for governments to kind of play to their political opportunism. So it is a difficult challenge for sure. Okay, uh, thank you so much. If you don't have anything further to, to add or comment, um, then I would just encourage you all to, to read Marco's excellent paper and to let's just uh, keep following how the situation develops. Uh, but of course, most importantly, very uh, big thanks to our great speakers today. So thank you.